everyone, and welcome to the session, Human-Centered Design and Gender. In this session, which features five panelists with a rich array of interests and expertise, we'll explore how vulnerable and marginalized populace, populations, such as women smallholder farmers and their households, have not historically been heavily engaged in the co-design of digital tools, technologies, and services. The principles of human-centered design present an opportunity to shift this paradigm and create digital solutions that better serve the complex livelihoods of smallholders. Michelle Ng, Digital Analyst at the International Water Management Institute, will open with a presentation on gender and digital inclusion. Then Luan Nio, Senior Partnerships Lead for Digital and Agricultural Work at IDO.org, will discuss principles of human-centered design and how they can lead to system level change. Araba Sapara Grant, Digital Specialist at DAI, will discuss digital ecosystems. Elizabeth Chin, Senior Service Designer on Proximity Designs Labs team, will examine several short and long-term applications. And finally, Diana Akron, UX Researcher and Google's Research and Machine Intelligence Department, will take a look at how human-centered design can be used to conduct meaningful research in rural and farming communities. You'll hear from each panelist, and then we'll open up for a group discussion among the speakers. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Ng, and I am a Digital Innovations Analyst at the International Water Management Institute. Um, as you've probably heard throughout this convention, uh, digital innovations have huge potential to support agriculture from providing agricultural advisory services to optimizing supply chains to forecasting floods and droughts. Um, however, one challenge to harnessing digital innovations for agriculture is digital inclusion. Uh, according to a 2019 CTA report, the percentage of female users of digital tools for agriculture is 10% in Senegal, 17% in Ethiopia, 20% in Nigeria, 28% in Kenya, and 30% in Ghana. Without, uh, sorry, without digital inclusion, we risk reinforcing inequalities in a positive feedback loop in which marginalized people become more marginalized and privileged people become more privileged. Within the context of sustainable development, we often talk about digital inclusion in terms of the digital divides. As you can imagine, one standpoint within interlocking systems of oppression, um, such as one's race, the binary of gender, sorry, the spectrum of gender, um, class, education, physical ability, and more, affect how one is able to access, use, and benefit from digital innovations. So the first level of the digital divide is access to the necessary hardware and software. This raises questions like, is the digital tool available in someone's area? Is it affordable? Um, if it breaks, are they able to make repairs? And an example of the first level digital divide with regard to gender comes from a 2019 GSMA report, which found that in low and middle income countries, women are 8% less likely to own mobile phones than men and 20% less likely to use mobile internet than men. Um, once someone has access to a digital tool, the second level digital divide questions whether they have the skills necessary to effectively use it. So these could include medium related skills, content related skills, or safety and security related skills, um, which impact whether they can effectively and responsibly use the tool. Um, an example of this comes from a 2017 UNESCO report, which found that in several countries, men are 33% more likely to be able to perform basic computational operations like copying and pasting. Um, it also found that men in some countries are four times more likely than women to know how to program. So this speaks not only to women's ability to use digital tools, but also their ability to create digital tools. Um, and maybe this goes without saying, but just as a caveat, digital tools, sorry, digital skills are not innate in any way and inherent in men and women's abilities. Um, but largely a product of one's environment, um, such as access to education and access to technology. So last but not least, um, once someone has access to a digital tool and the skills to use it, the third level of the digital divide um, refers to inequalities in real world outcomes that result from using that tool. So for example, a 2011 study 
of around 600 female micro entrepreneurs in Chennai, India, um, who were all using their mobile phones for business purposes, found that women with higher entrepreneurial expectations benefited more from their mobile phone usage than women with lower entrepreneurial expectations. But in this case, entrepreneurial expectations were positively correlated with class, caste, and education. So this just kind of goes to show how intersectionality plays a role here, where even within groups of women, um, social factors can still perpetuate the third level of the digital divide. Uh, so the digital dis dis divides framework is useful for promoting people's access to digital innovations and their ability to harness them. Um, but once people have access to technologies, it's still their decision whether or not to use them. And I think this is part of digital inclusion that's less talked about. Um, the same CTA report in 2019 found that of the 390 digital tools for agriculture in Africa, the top 20 account for 78% of total reach. And of the 26 million unique registered users in Africa who are reached by a digital tool for agriculture, only 11 million remain engaged with one. So this speaks to how many digital tools for agriculture aren't being used and how many users try a digital tool for agriculture but conclude that it's not worth their time. Um, so this is where design really comes in as a key part of digital inclusion, because even if people have access and the skills to use a digital tool, it's possible that they're excluded by the design of the tool itself, since people have different design preferences. And this could result in people deciding not to use the digital tool at all. So for instance, non-literate or low-literate people um, may not feel comfortable with the text-based interface, but they could have preferred a pictorial interface or a voice-based interface. Um, and some gender-specific preferences, which could influence the design of technologies, may include motivations for using technology, information processing styles, one's own sense of their computer self-efficacy, um, attitudes toward risk, and learning style. So in short, um, Human-centered design works with end users to create tools that are more useful and usable by taking their needs, values, and aspirations into account during the design process. And this would ideally result in digital tools that more diverse people would like to use, thus promoting digital inclusion. Um, so I'll leave it to Luan to talk more about what human-centered design is um, and how this works in, in practice but I hope this kind of contextualizes human-centered design within wider discourse around digital inclusion within sustainable development. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And that's it for me. Um, well, thank you so much, Michelle. That's an amazing introduction. Um, my name is Luan Neo, and I lead partnerships at idea.org where I drive our agriculture portfolio with a focus on designing for women and youth. And digital is a large part of that work, especially now during COVID times. So real quick about IDEO.org, we are a nonprofit design studio. We spun off from the design firm IDEO nine years ago, and our um, social impact mission is really to design for a more just and inclusive world. Um, so we have studios across San Francisco, New York, and Nairobi, um, and I've worked like with close to 40 countries. So at the backbone of all of our work is human-centered design. And what that is, is really, it's a creative way of problem solving that puts the user really at the center of the process. So if you think about great design, that sits typically at that intersection of viability, um, meaning that it can live on and has a viable, sustainable business model. Um, feasibility, meaning that it's designed to the capability of the context and adapted to its needs. And it's technically actually feasible to, to make the solution, to build the solution and desirability, meaning that there's, uh, there has to be a need for it from the community you're working for. So, and that's really our starting point. That's our entry point uh, with ATD. We start with, with people. We start with the people we are designing for. And we like to look at it this way. Um, when we do that, we want to explore what lies below the surface to inspire and set the direction really of new types of solutions. So typically um, how humans behave, like what we say and do is sometimes different from what we think and what we feel. It's informed by how we think and how we feel. So, but if you understand those feelings and those thoughts of the users you design for, you have a better chance that the solution will be a success because you've explored what lies below the surface and you've kept the very people you're, you're looking to serve at the heart of the process. 
So if we go about doing human-centered designs, a process typically looks like this. Uh, there's a number of steps. It typically starts with what we call design research to learn directly from the people you're designing for as you immerse yourself in their lives and come to deeply understand their needs. And then next step would be synthesis, where we're aiming to make sense out of what we heard. We, we pull out the patterns and opportunities. Uh, this is often where we create user archetypes or personas and user journey. So really what's the experience from the user perspective at the various steps along the way and what are the moments that we want to design for. Um, and then we start, we start ideating, we start brainstorming. So you probably, you know, um, uh, lots of post-it notes and just lots of people in the room and ideas uh, coming, coming about with possible solutions and really wanting to go for quantity and breadth of options. And then we narrow down and feel, okay, which ones we want to take forward and really build into concepts and prototypes and um, present to users and like bring those ideas to life. And we iterate on those, we improve those ideas as we go and we expose them more to users. And with the end, really refining. Um, and even when the solution is in market, this, this process would continue to, uh, to be refined and, and such. So if you look at that wave below, so think of it this way, that the, the, the y-axis is basically the number of ideas that we typically have at each of the different steps of the process. Uh, it's really the purpose that we, that we have diverging and converging moments. So at some, some points we are very expansive about the possibilities, and at other moments we are more rigorous and realistic about what the solution could be. So this is typically like in theory how a solution, how the process would look like, a very linear and nice, but in, in practice it's rarely linear and it often feels like this. Um, so, uh, so it can like, it, it, it sometimes feels that you're in a swirl of things and just that, as if there's no progress, but that's really part of, of like how human-centered design feels and, and shows up. When done well, a human-centered approach fuels really the creation of products that resonate more deeply with the audience and ultimately driving engagement and growth. So it really captures the human details. So I want to share with you a story of Champa. She's a woman we've met in rural India as part of a program to design better digital financial services for women. Uh, she lives with her husband. He's a day laborer at neighboring farms. And when we ask her, hey, Champa, do you, do you save money? She would say, no, that's not my role. I'm too poor. Um, so, uh, she, so we asked deeper, so what would you do then? Like if you have those three kids and you want to send them to school and there's an emergency, what would you do? Um, and she, she would say, well, I have this box that I use. Turns out that Champa actually has money put away in a box that she hides in her house. And the box has a certain name to her. It's called Mitter, which in Hindi means friend. Um, and that's like what most of the women in, in that village do. So we're learning here that women like Champa do not associate putting money in her in a meter with the terminology or with the explanation that of behavior of savings. Um, and the people around her might not know or might not acknowledge this behavior that she's showing. Um, so understanding this and how she just really is super inventive about um, how to manage money for her household. Um, and like all of the other social norms and behaviors and gender dynamics, that can really help um, inform how we design for women like Champa. So um, we've informed like with a large MNO, a telco in India, um, about this service. They wanted to bring a digital savings product onto the market. So how about if we would change the name of that product into Midder, like how she refers to her box, how if, if it was really tailored to her life and is associated with things that she is already familiar with so that she's invited at every touch point of the way of when interacting with that solution that she knows that it's really made for her. So that's a story uh, of Champa and there are many women like Champa who we've met over the years doing human-centered design. Um, so based on what we've learned, I'd like to share a few design principles that we try to adhere to when we design for women. So first of all, build for women first. Um, and that might sound um, straightforward, but it's actually really hard because current solutions are often designed by men or it's often men who take decisions about the trajectory of a design. And frankly, um, like often it's done with anyone in mind, it's not women specific. So if you design for everyone, you design for men actually. So to support gender equality and women's economic empowerment, we must be deliberate and specific about, the, uh, about putting women front and center and gender sensitivity into our solutions. We must design for women first and constantly seek their feedback to really achieve those gender transformative solutions that directly aim to transform the, the power dynamics and bring about systems change. Because if we don't, we reinforce the status quo and we risk up 
we risk ending up with solutions that are gender neutral or maybe even gender negative. Um, secondly, um, make um, the foreign familiar. So when we talk about specifically digital solutions, many of those require skills and resources and knowledge that women might not have to start off with. So uh, our design should incorporate as much as possible elements from her life that she's already familiar with and the best of her existing workarounds. Like for example, um, we see that women um, like really remember and learn themselves specific placement of options on her phone to complete the trans transaction or how she uses proxies or other people that she trusts to make transactions. So how do we design and build that into the solutions that we create? And lastly, um, each digital trans interaction is an opportunity for her to build her digital muscle. We should try to teach, guide, and boost her confidence whenever she interacts. We should not test her, but help bounce her back when she struggles, because she will, or when the system fails her, because it is failing her, and make it easier for her to re-enter the system and be very confident and, um, and just push through. So to do, to, to do that, we have released a set of tools that can be helpful um, to design um, uh, solutions for first-time internet users. So the link is over there, digitalconfidence.design. Um, so yeah, this is um, some design terms to take, in, to take in consideration when designing for women specifically. And hopefully this is a very helpful and love to hear um, from the other panelists as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. I think we just heard two great presentations that really contextualized um, human-centered design for us and really explained what the concept means. Um, but for my presentation, I'd like to switch gears a little bit just to discuss the digital ecosystem and how it can actually impact how we think about human-centered design and its effectiveness. Um, so just to start off, my name is Arava Sapara Grant, and I work for a company called DAI. Um, we're a development consulting firm based just outside of Washington, DC. Um, and I'm actually a digital specialist with our Center for Digital Acceleration. Um, if I could describe our work, I would say that our role is really to offer our clients the tools and insights that they need to understand the full spectrum of how digital technology is impacting and interacting with um, the development agenda in the countries that they serve. Um, we find it incredibly important not only to understand the user, the tools that they're using, but then also the entire ecosystem in which all of these things and people exist, um, which is what we'll be discussing today. So without repeating too much of what's already been discussed um, by Michelle and Luan, um, we've definitely come to the same conclusions um, that they highlighted in their presentations. Um, we understand that um, designing with the user rather than for the user can have a huge impact on the inclusivity of digital tools um, and the ability of these tools to fit into the pretty complex lives of smallholder farmers and particularly women um, who we've learned have very unique livelihoods. And what I mean by that is that they have multiple income generating activities, multiple sources of income. Um, so while human centered design is incredibly important, what we've learned from some of our work is that the results of, human of the human centered design process are only as strong as the context in which they fit. Um, and so what is that context? That context is the digital ecosystem excuse me, ecosystem, um, something that we understand as the business, political, and regulatory environment um, in which a digital solution is introduced. Um, the dynamics in this ecosystem have, can potentially have very long-term implications on the sustainability and impact of any given digital solution. Um, you may have heard the term digital ecosystem. I think we've all um, at DAI and at CDA have found that it's becoming more familiar in the international development um, vocabulary. If you looked through USAID's recent digital strategy, you'll see that they define the digital ecosystem as, you know, being comprised of stakeholders, systems, and enabling environments. Um, but basically, the thoughts or the idea that we would like to bring to this conversation is that while user preferences and pain points are extremely important. Um, we also need to start asking questions about the ecosystem, the context in which the solution is being designed. So we wanna ask questions like, you know, are there local IT firms who can support the maintenance and rollout of a tool? Um, what are the role of mobile network operators or government regulations? Um, what, and what role do they play in supporting or hindering these tools um, to actually reach scale? This isn't an exhaustive list of questions, but it gives a sense of how we are starting to think about how to combine user insights with an understanding of if and how um, the ecosystem can support the solutions that we're designing with users. 
why is this important? I think coming back to the kind of focus of this panel, it's going to be incredibly important to understand these dynamics as we continue to target women and address some of the gender issues um, that we face in this field. It's important to examine not only how women are using digital tools, but also how the ecosystem level barriers that impact their access um, also uh, interact with these these uh, questions. So something that Michelle mentioned, you know, we're all very familiar with this concept of the digital divide, women being 10% less likely than men to own a mobile phone and 23% less likely to use mobile internet. Um, we know that technology can exacerbate some of these dynamics and impact the usability of an even impeccably designed tool. Um, so that's something that we really want to keep in mind um, and, and to just point out that understanding the world, both from the bottom up approach, using human centered design principles to design tools that really fit into the, um, into the life of a user, but then also understanding things from the top down as well um, by assessing, excuse me, digital ecosystems will allow us to design better tools for the women that we serve. Um, so just to note, it's not necessarily what we're discussing isn't about replacing um, the human centered design process, but rather um, about complementing it. So what does this look like in practice? At DAI, we take a hybrid approach um, to understanding some of these dynamics and merging both the bottom up approach of understanding user needs, as well as the ecosystem level insights to understand the context in which certain digital solutions operate. Um, so to illustrate, I can talk about an experience I recently had. Um, we conducted an ICT assessment in Uganda, and the purpose of this assessment was to map and evaluate the landscape of ICT firms and service providers that were developing tools and technologies for the agriculture sector. So in addition to this mapping exercise, we also made sure to study the history, the policies, and the trends that were shaping Uganda's digital ecosystem. And so if you're familiar um, with this environment, this is you know, highlighting things like the social media tax that could impact the use of things like Facebook or WhatsApp. Um, so in addition to understanding the marketplace, we made sure to also hold um, focus groups with some agricultural cooperatives and producer organizations to capture their experience using tools that are already available in the marketplace. And while these focus groups uncovered some challenges that could have been addressed by um, human-centered design, it also revealed some pain points that were more related to the ecosystem. So for example, there were participants that had access to a platform that allowed them to order uh, inputs online um, using a, a mobile system. And what we found out is that they were actually having to do double duty. Um, because the connectivity in their area was so poor, they were having to make the orders in the platform and then actually calling the person who they were making the order to to let them know that the message would be on its way. Like I mentioned, the connectivity was so poor, it could take up to a day um, for the message to actually reach them. Um, and so because of this ecosystem challenge, um, we were finding that people were, you know, falling on informal solutions. So using things like WhatsApp groups that extension officers share with each other or free websites. Um, and so that led us to the conclusion that until ecosystem design challenges are addressed, users will revert to informal solutions. And just to close, you know, why is this an issue? This is an issue um, because when those solutions fail due to ecosystem challenges and there is, you know, this fallback to um, informal solutions, it can often impact women. Um, using the example of this WhatsApp group, what do we know? We know that men are primarily extension officers, men are primarily mobile phone operators, and all of a sudden they become the intermediaries um, between getting information into the hands of women. Um, and so if we do not consider ecosystem obstacles and um, digital solutions can be rendered obsolete, and in this case of Uganda, um, give way to solutions that can exclude women and fail to move the needle on the digital divide. Um, so I'll stop there and just say that these are some of the insights from our work and some of our perspectives on the digital ecosystem and human-centered design, um, and I look forward to discussing further. All right. Great, thank you, Arva. I resonated a lot with those insights on considering the ecosystem. Um, today, I'd like to take you through some applications of what human-centered design has looked like at proximity during this time of uncertainty. Um, but first, to introduce ourselves, um, hello, hi, I'm Elizabeth Chin, and Proximity Designs is a social enterprise in Myanmar. 
our mission is to increase the income, livelihoods, and resilience of smallholder farmers there. Um, but in terms of how we actually integrate human-centered design into our work, we believe that to best meet the needs of millions of farmers and understand their systemic barriers, we need to have proximity and empathy to them. So this means meeting them in their own environment to identify their needs, their motivations, generate ideas with them and build solutions that um, really impact their families. And Sometimes this means going out to conduct interviews. Sometimes it means role-playing services um, with farmers or co-creation workshops. But however we invite them to participate in the process, we bring them in as early as we can. Um, however, the pandemic raised a lot of problems and trying to stay close to the communities um, that we serve became a tremendous challenge. And so this raised, um, a few questions for us to design around. And the first one I think that really came to mind was like, how do we identify and respond to these emerging problems from an unprecedented crisis? And in the short term, um, we responded by implementing a robust monitoring system. And through biweekly surveys and um, in-depth phone interviews in the thousands, we kept a constant pulse on what farmers were doing seeing, thinking, um, and feeling in this new world, while also zooming out um, and collecting data about changes in crop prices and food supply chains as well. And we did a couple things with these learnings. One, we provided our findings to um, the government's COVID-19 response committee with some policy suggestions. But two, our learnings really helped us shape public health communication for farmers in collaboration um, with Myanmar's Ministry of Social Welfare, Relief and Resettlement. When we think about the mandate to work from home, um, that's not really an option for people in rural Myanmar. So what does social distancing look like for a smallholder farmer? So we took our up-to-date understanding of their daily lives to communicate how to make preventive behaviors more relevant to their harvesting activities and interactions with laborers. Um, and through this initiative, we reached over 12 million farmers, which I am really excited to share. Normal, and not only do farmers have shifting priorities during this time, but they're also rapidly, so when we think about the long-term, how do we adapt to a new digital to the critical farm services that we offer? We love empathy so time to a foundational picture of digital behaviors among farmers in Myanmar. Um, but Myanmar, previously being one of the most isolated countries in the world, is a unique digital leapfrog. Dial-up modems, um, email, and as you'll see here, SMS have been jumped over into the world of social media platforms, with Facebook in particular being the predominant social network that um, everyone uses as their source of internet and information. And so an obvious solution to this would be to develop an agronomy app for farmers to download and interact with us. But this medium has several challenges. Introducing a new interface, requiring a download in the first place, and by expanding our knowledge onto Facebook and investing in designing a comprehensive chatbot um, we're building on an experience that farmers are used to, we're meeting them where they are, um, and we're also teaching techniques in a new way beyond direct extension service. Um, to this day, we have nearly 900,000 subscribers on this chatbot and are continuing to design new conversation flows that are more personalized to their needs. So that's how we share um, a bit of our expertise, but in terms of our actual products, we needed to adapt the way we work to make it as easy as possible for anyone to buy and use our products. And by looking at our process and redesigning our operations from end to end, from digital marketing to warehouse production to contactless delivery, how we can keep people safe 
and looking at whether we are hiring women in those positions, we can scale our impact by providing a seamless customer experience that also naturally grows with farmers' digitalness. And granted, that's not easy, and we don't have a perfect solution, but I think another important principle of human-centered design is um, to iterate and to learn from mistakes, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. So one of our newest explorations is teleagronomy and what it looks like to be present as a crop doctor on the phone. And this is especially crucial for the segment of farmers that aren't on Facebook um, and don't have data, but we're also really committed to identifying the barriers that intersect with gender, digital literacy, um, even language now and in the future. So these are just a few examples and I hope that it inspires relevant needs. We're in this tough and challenging time together, um, but I think it's also really important that we are starting to talk to each other about our learnings and collaborate. And so now I'll hand it off to Diana, who will be speaking about conducting research in farming communities. Hello, my name is Diana Cron and I'm a user experience researcher from Google Research. Today I'm honored to be part of this panel because it gives me a chance to talk about a topic that I'm passionate about and share some tools to equip you to implement what you've heard today about human-centered design from the other panelists and hopefully compel you to be an HCD advocate in future product design and development. So here's a recap of what we had, what we've learned so far. Um, so far, we've learned the meaning of human-centered design, the value of understanding user needs, the value of designing with users and for a given context or ecosystem, and the value of prototyping and testing ideas with potential users. Um, in the next five to seven minutes, my goal is to give you a deeper dive into research, walk through an example of a research method, and share tips for successful interaction with potential users in farming communities based on my previous experience working in farming communities with farmers. Um, so we've heard a bit about what research in human-centered design is. Um, just a basic recap is that it's a chance for us to learn more about the problem space that we're investigating. Um, this is how we learn about the topic and it adds context and insights to the design and development process. There are different types of research that help us to understand different types of questions. Um, so I'm going to look at three of these. Foundational research helps us to understand what to build. It happens early on in the process. Tactical research helps us to understand how to build it. And evaluative research helps us to answer the question of, did we succeed in building it based on whatever research goals we had? And whatever we need to, and to consider what we need to do to make, um, improve a, user, a user's experience. Um, <clears throat> there are several research methods that exist within these research types that help to answer different questions. For each of these, a researcher will plan a study, will execute the study, and will make sense of the data that they find. And previous panelists have alluded to this. I'm going to show what this looks like using an example. So let's walk through this. Um, let's imagine that crop diseases are destroying farms in a rural community, as an example of a project that we want to work on. Um, an example definition that we might want to focus on is how we class um, that we want to classify crop diseases and recommend treatments to farmers. Um, in, in hypothesizing this, we might want to outline what we know and do not know about the problem space. This gives us the chance to figure out what we want to investigate once we are in the field. Um, for this, for the purpose of this example, we're going to we're going to use desk research to create a literature review. Um, to be able to share, have a shared understanding amongst the team of what's happening in this problem space that we're investigating. And we're going to assume that we're choosing to use interviews as a way to investigate this problem space. Um, our sample here, who we decide to talk to and um, how we decide to recruit them. Let's say we're working with farmers, agriculture extension officers, and agrochemical suppliers. So as Araba alluded to, it's important to understand the context in which you're designing and who, which ecosystem actors or players exist within the space to be able to know who to talk to for a given problem. Um, this is just an example, and we're going to assume that we're talking to farmers, extension officers, and agrochemical suppliers. And you can choose to expand this as you learn more about the problem space. Um, so in planning, you want to understand 
you want to research and understand cultural norms. Um, so this gives you a chance to show respect for local practices on the ground. Um, for example, in some home visits, you might be asked to take off your slippers before you walk into a home, or you might be asked to take off your hat before you say hi to, before you um, greet a chief. Um, but we should be intentional about diversity, and we should identify locals that we can work with when we conduct research in local communities. Um, it helps us to establish rapport quick, and we should also plan for infrastructure limitations such as limited connectivity and no power outlets and farms. Um, it's nice to learn local greetings and phrases if you have the time to do so. Um, so in the execution phase, we want to visit participants and gather. Here's a sample conversation flow that you might go through. You start with a greeting. You want to invest as much time as possible in beginning the session with a chance to build a rapport with your participants, make them feel as comfortable as possible, um, and that pays huge dividends along the line. Get everybody warmed up before you start with any tasks. Um, thank participants before you leave the session. So here's an example of what this looks like in execution. Um, it helps to co-create tools as a reference for discussion, especially when you're talking to people with different diverse literacy levels. Um, it helps to have a point of reference for the discussion you're having so that you can question things where, where you feel necessary. Um, so this is an example of a crop calendar done across a year, um, mapping expenses and income sources. Um, and image two is an example of a spent calendar showing how much people spend on airtime, where who purchases the airtime, um, and how they get them to their phones. Um, more examples of using paper prototypes, it helps to reduce the intimidation that farmers or smallholder farmers might feel when you give them um, a physical phone, a real phone to interact with. So I've seen this, especially in the case of financial products where people think they might be applying for a real loan as opposed to um, an example loan that they're applying for. This is an example of me literally walking in the shoes of a farmer to be able to understand the nuances of what they do. As Michelle alluded to, people, what people say and what people do are not always the same thing. And it's important to be able to see things in practice as much as possible, get them to show and not tell you. Um, and where, where possible, have people use their own devices um, that they're familiar with and comfortable with so they can show you what a day in their lives looks like. Um, as part of your research team, you want to consider having a moderator who has the closest relationship to your participant, um, builds rapport, someone to take notes, observe, take pictures, and interpret where necessary. Um, as much as possible, do not have people idol in your research team. Um, everybody who is there should have a role and the size should not overwhelm your participants. So in the execution phase, remember to introduce your team, be curious, use paper prototypes, laminate these if you can, um, avoid technical jargon. So if you're testing a, if you're testing an interface, do not use things like drop down buttons and things that they might not understand. Um, thank people before you leave and do not make any promises real or fake just in case you're not able to fill on them. Um, it's nice to participate in farm activities, observe them whenever you can or whenever your time allows you to. Um, and then I guess as last, at the last part of this process, you want to synthesize the insights that you find and you want to propose actionable recommendations um, and then pilot and deploy whatever recommendations you have. So here's an example of how you can do that using a, um, a customer journey um, or user journey as a way to build empathy with users or help people who were not in the field to have an experience of what you found um, and understand and prioritize user needs. Um, this is an example of an output that comes out of research. So this is something um, I contributed to as a UX expert in collaboration with Frog Design and GSMA. Um, it's an MIP Design Toolkit and the link is below if you'd like to check it out. Um, so yeah, in sense making, use as, much, as many summary tools as possible to be able to explain your ideas to people who are not in the field, help them to empathize with users and improve on designs and um, improve on designs through pilot study and iterations as much as possible. Consider sharing those as well. Here are some tools you should consider checking out. Um, some of my favorite tools, um, and this is one created by my team, which has best practices, worksheets, and examples, synthesizing some of what Google has learned so far for building human-centered AI tools. Um, yeah, so now we know the meaning of HCD, the value of understanding user needs, and the value of designing with users, the value of prototyping and testing ideas, 
and with potential users and how to prepare for research in farming communities. Um, I'll just end by saying that agriculture is a complex domain with high stakes. The cost of a negative experience could have implications on the livelihood of individuals, individual smallholder farmers, and on larger issues like food security. Digital tools work in social context and their development should therefore be within the framework of the ecosystem with an understanding of user needs and the context of use and designed in partnership with potential users. Um, this is critical to building and designing sustainable systems which fit into the lives of users, augment their capacities, and are both useful and usable. Thank you. Thanks everyone for each of those presentations. I'm so glad to have you all in the same room to share your work. Um, I'm gonna transition us now into a brief discussion period I'll start off with a question and then the floor is open for panelists to connect and debate amongst themselves. Um, so a common thread through all of your presentations were that you are employ employing a human-centered design process with the goal of enacting system level change. So increasing access to usability and effectiveness of digital tools and services that have the power to transform lives. So how will these shifts that you're pushing for, which ultimately shift power to the end user lead to increased resilience in food systems? I can go first, um, just referencing some of the work that we did in Uganda. At the same time that we did this ICT assessment, we actually also did a gender assessment. Um, and through that research, we found that women in particular are very savvy about which income generating activities they use at any given time. So while they might make the majority of their income from agriculture, they're also doing a number of other activities. And so I think that's something that is very important that would come out of a human-centered design process to understand that divide, um, designing a tool for a woman that is value chain specific and doesn't really have any other um, capabilities or any other um, functions might not be the best solution for her. Um, and that's a major uh, concept or idea to keep in mind for resilience, especially um, in the context of COVID-19, where people are, are having to be so creative and so savvy about how they, um, you know, maintain their livelihoods, keep income coming into their households, um, really understanding just because a woman says that she's a farmer doesn't mean that that's the only thing that she does. So keeping that in mind can really shift power to that woman, to that end user, and make sure that they um, maintain their livelihoods and some sense of resilience you know, throughout these very challenging times. Um, I can go next. Um, it's been really great to hear of this common theme of participation in all of the presentations because I think design and innovation um, are largely about imagining the future. Um, and so when we think about kind of progressive visions of design, like designs for the pluriverse by Arturo Escobar, um, grassroots innovation by Anil Gupta, design justice by Sash Sasha Costanza Chalk and so on, um, they talk about design and innovation as though they're emergent properties of new combinations of people and ideas and resources. Um, and it seems clear to me that if it's only experts leading design processes, there's a limited number of ideas that can come out, especially when we need really context specific ideas for resilience in the context of the Anthropocene and so on. Um, so I think the more people who can be included in design processes, um, the more local knowledge and the more kind of context specific responses can kind of bubble up through design. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that by saying that I agree that um, who gets to participate in the creation of the tools is as important as who gets to use these tools. Um, but also, when we talk about resilience, we should consider, it's even more important to consider the ecosystem design and designing for the agriculture value chain as opposed to a specific phase of it. So if you were helping farmers to maximize their yield, for example, it's also important to think about what happens down the line when there's a production boom and they need to be able to sell off that produce. Otherwise, we ended up with more wasted food and we end up with farmers who are unhappy with um, what the outcome of their activities. I think I would also add onto that kind of building on what Araba and what um, Diana were saying around like when we think about like the entire value chain as well and thinking about who's going to be taking part in the creation of the tools in every single stage, 
who are we hiring in those positions? Um, and so like not only are you thinking about who are you collaborating with and to what extent and how are you strategic about communicating with those partners, um, but who are you hiring on the front lines? Who are you hiring in your managerial positions? That's some, been something that's been super crucial for proximity as well. And even thinking about like when you're partnering with government organizations as well, um, how can you continue to include those gender related or class related or including like those tough topics about systemic um, barriers into those conversations and really integrate it on a regular basis. I think it's difficult and it's an uncomfortable one to do as well. It's not natural, um, but I think it's something that we need to be conscious of um, and be really intentional about in our day-to-day -day work. 